honor of introducing Danielle DiMartino Booth, who is here to um, talk with us today. And she, Danielle is currently a chief market strategist at the Lithium Report. Prior to her time there, Danielle worked at the Federal Reserve um, under Mr. Fisher as an advisor for nine years. And when Mr. Fisher retired, um, Danielle went on as well. And prior to that, she was uh, working as a columnist in the Dallas Morning News. But she began her career in New York um, on Wall Street, working in fixed income and private equity markets. Uh, Danielle's earned a BBA from the College of Business at the University of, of Texas in San Antonio. She also holds an MBA in finance from UT Austin and an MS in journalism from Columbia. And uh, Danielle's someone near and dear to my heart who I work with, and I'm happy to turn it over to her. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, one thing we had in common from the get-go is that we had uh, three names each. I acquired mine by marriage. I'm still waiting to see what happens with her. She <laughs> ended up with four instead of three, so stay tuned. Um, in any event, thank you for having me here. Thank you for all of you coming here this early in the morning. My ways got really confused on the way here, but eventually Therese guided me into the building. In any event. Um, so again, I, I, I come from central banking. It was almost a decade that I was working uh, for Mr. Fisher. And I have to say at this point that old dogs have a hard time learning new tricks. You may have heard that saying. I suppose that's why I'm having a really hard time just jumping into my comments without some kind of a disclaimer, because that's what bureaucrats do. They disclaim. Okay. So how about I sort of tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Does that work? I feel better. Um, as you can see, the Fed has left its mark on me. But luckily, the imprint stops with trivialities and disclaimers. Thankfully, the brainwashing never took hold. You may be wondering about my title, The Great Abdication. Am I going to regale you with stories about past British monarchies? Not exactly. When I was pondering the title of my debut piece that summed up my reflections on the institution where I worked for Richard Fisher for the better part of a decade, two words came to mind, abdication and complicity. The abdication refers to Congress. The complicity takes aim at the Fed. Let me explain. The ability to finance the debt of the United States is hugely dependent upon the kindness of strangers in Shanghai. If the Chinese were to curtail their demand for U.S. Treasuries, we would all feel the pain back here at home in the form of higher interest rates, a hike that would be triggered thousands of miles away and not by the Federal Reserve. Now, you may be saying that this notion is unthinkable. The Chinese need us as much as we need them. That's certainly still the case today. But the figures don't lie. Chinese foreign reserves have begun to shrink. They've declined by a tenth over the past year. And the powers that be have publicly stated that they want to become a less export-dependent economy. We, we read more and more about China trying to become a more services economy like the United States every day. Now, if they accomplish their goal and generate more economic growth from their own domestic consumers, they will indeed have much less of a need to buy our treasury bonds. Now, where does the Fed fit into that equation? Well, first off, Fed officials are plenty aware that the Chinese and other foreign buyers of our debt can't be dependent upon indefinitely. It follows, then, that they're aware that the country's politicians have squandered a perfectly good opportunity to indemnify the nation's balance sheet at this time of extraordinarily low historic borrowing costs. And extending out the maturities of the debt would help the country prepare to, be, to reduce our reliance on the kindness of strangers if interest rates rise to untenable levels at some point in the future, which we hope will happen. We would at least have the gift of time to write out any kind of a crisis in confidence. Now, this graph, which ran last fall in the Wall Street Journal, helps illustrate my point. The story it accompanied highlighted the surge in ultra-long bond issuance which is defined as a bond with a maturity of 30 years or longer. Governments and corporations alike were rushing into the bond market to take advantage, again, of the lowest <coughs> borrowing costs in history. And it's not just, and by the way, somebody looked it up recently, and borrowing costs are at their lowest level in approximately 5,000 years. <laughs> Make note. And we're not just talking about the pretty usual suspects here, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and Austria. Our Canadian neighbors to the north issued two 50-year bonds, while Mexico to the south issued a 100-year bond in euros. Fiscal basket case Spain was even able to tap the bonds market for a 50-year issue. 
Corporate CEOs have also been batting down the hatches and secure funding for years to come. McDonald's and Caterpillars have recently been among more prominent issuers of ultra-long bonds. As for Uncle Sam, let's just say the U.S. Treasury has been conspicuous in its absence from the bond market to say nothing of the plain vanilla long bond market. We're talking about the 30-year bond here. In fact, we've been going in the opposite direction, issuing increasing amounts of the shortest maturities. You may have noticed that on Monday we auctioned off the, the three-month T-bill at an interest rate of zero. The next time you hear a politician crow about how much the deficit has shrunk, and we're hearing a lot more of it in this campaign season, ask them what the country's interest expenses would be in a world where the Fed was not holding rates at artificially low levels. It's hard to imagine the country paid only 1.8%, 1.8% on its debt in 2015, despite the fact that our debt outstanding has trebled. Had we been paying what we term as normalized interest rates these past six years, the deficit that hit a seven-year low recently would have been double what was reported. Hopefully you can see how politicians have benefited <coughs> thanks to the Fed's largesse. But make no mistake, the citizens of this country will ultimately pay the price for this chicanery. In the meantime, the Fed has complied with Congress's bidding. Risks have continued to build in the financial system. That's what happens every single time monetary policy is left too easy for too long. In fact, I would venture to say that many of you in this room cannot remember a time in your careers, given how young you all are, when interest rates were actually positive. Think about that. Now, in a normal state, markets function as price discovery mechanisms. I was at a forum called Gibby yesterday, Great Investments. Um, it, it's a huge charity that Shagro runs. Were any of you there yesterday? It's a wonderful charitable organization. Michael J. Fox was there. Um, we, we support a Vickery Park. Uh, anyways, if you ever get a chance to go to Gibby, make, make your time to do it. In any event, everybody was talking about price discovery because they're market players and price discovery, as we know, it has disappeared. So let me share, 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 uh, share with you a story to illustrate. And I apologize if you've heard this before, but I doubt you have. Um, many of you will recognize this lovely little box as the iconic representation of Tiffany's Jewelers, as it so happens. A story related to Mr. Tiffany and J.P. Morgan, the banker, related to me by my great friend, Arthur Cashin, has proved immensely valuable in explaining what it is exactly that financial markets do to my four children. Now, I know it's early in the day, but you two will remember this story if you give me just a minute of your attention. Now, being the astute jeweler that he was, Mr. Tiffany knew that Mr. Morgan had an acute affinity for diamond stick pins. One day, Tiffany came across a particularly unusual and extraordinarily beautiful stick pin. As was custom of the day, he sent a man around to Morgan's office with the stick pin, elegantly wrapped in a robin's egg blue gift box with the following note. My dear Mr. Morgan, knowing your exceptional taste in stick pins, I have sent this rare and exquisite piece for your consideration. Due to its rarity, it is priced at $5,000. If you choose to accept it, Please send a man to my offices tomorrow with your check for $5,000. If you choose not to accept, you may send your man back with the pin. The next day, the Morgan man arrived at Tiffany's with the same box in a new wrapping in a different envelope. In that envelope was a note which read, Dear Mr. Tiffany, the pin is truly magnificent. The price of $5,000 may be a bit rich. I have enclosed a check for $4,000. If you choose to accept, send my man back with the box. If not, send back the check and he will leave the box with you. Tiffany stared at the check for several minutes. It was indeed a great deal of money, yet he was sure the pin was worth $5,000. Finally, he said to the man, you may return the check to Mr. Morgan, my price was firm. And so the man <coughs> took the check and placed the gift wrap box on Tiffany's desk. Tiffany sat for a minute thinking of the check he'd return and then he unwrapped the box to remove the stick pin. When he opened the box, he found not the stick pin, but rather a check from Morgan for $5,000 and a note with just a single sentence on it. Just checking the price. Just checking the price. That, my friends, is how markets, financial markets, all markets are meant to operate. 
I'm sad to report that that is not how markets have operated for a good long time, thanks to what I call the obfuscation of price discovery that's emerged as a result, again, of interest rates being held too low for too long. Obfuscation, which I can hardly pronounce, but have come to understand all too well, is defined as the hiding of intended meaning. The Latin root of the word literally means to darken over. How long have the markets been in the dark, so to speak? Well, I'll reserve that answer the rest of my, to, to the end of my remarks. As for the most recent episode, we're nearly seven years into price obfuscation. Seven years. That's how long it's been since policymakers voted to lower interest rates to the zero bound in the hopes of, sp of spurring a fully sustainable economic recovery. In the meantime, the Fed's balance sheet has ballooned to $4.4 trillion. It remains there, there today. In the event you were, you were unaware, the Fed has remained an active buyer in the Treasury and the mortgage-backed securities markets just to maintain the size of the balance sheet as holdings mature. If you can imagine, this task requires the Fed to buy 25% of mortgage-backed securities issued in the market today. As for the economy, it's been growing at 2.2% for all of the six years that we've been in this recovery. Now, think about that for a minute. We've printed our way to kingdom come and back, and all we have to show for it is 2% economic growth. I get that we haven't suffered a recession in an extraordinarily long time, but I can also recall the wonderment at the last time the world celebrated the suspension and animation of the business cycle. They called it the great moderation of the Fed, and it didn't end well. <clears throat> Surely there are fruits to the Fed's largesse. Well, I won't deny the improvement in the labor market, and there's no doubt the housing market is, is well past its darkest days. But the Fed's closest friends, we've come to find out, are known as investors. For this Tony cohort, the fruits of the Fed's zero interest rate policy are bountiful on a record scale. Some $30 trillion has been tacked on to the collective net worth of American households since the financial markets bottomed in March of 2009. Investors faced with making no money on their savings have poured money into riskier assets such as junk bonds in the stock market. The end result? Households' net worth is a record 4.8 times higher than the nation's gross domestic product. To put that into context, from the 1950s through the late 1990s, net worth hovered between three and four times GDP. The ratio has risen above four on three occasions at the height of the dot-com boom, during the housing bubble, and for the past five years. Those comparisons don't provide me any comfort. To add insult to injury, the current rally has disproportionately benefited the 20% of Americans who control 80% of its financial assets. That's largely left behind the average household whose biggest asset was and remains their home. The $24 trillion in paper wealth created during the housing boom, as fleeting as it proved to be, was at least more spread out. What else has happened since the housing market peaked? Well, not a whole heck of a lot, according to this chart. Since May 2008, per capita income growth adjusted for inflation has risen by a half of a percent. I've shown this slide for years, and I can't wait to take it out of my speech so that I can stop repeating that the current generation of Americans is the first in post-war history who've not been able to achieve the American dream of making more than their parents did. Now think about that for a minute while keeping in mind that the mother's milk of our country's growth is consumption. Consumption is 70% of the U.S. economy. How have U.S. households managed to keep the economy growing at all if their incomes have barely budged upwards? Well, to answer that question, Look no further than the same driver that propelled the economy to great heights at the start of this young century. Look no further than debt. While I'm sure everyone in this room can attest to the fact that there's nowhere near as much mortgage debt being churned out as there was during the housing boom, other forms of debt creation have eagerly stepped up, stepped up to fill the gap. Household deleveraging ended the second quarter of 2013, but the real story, excuse me, near its peak, but the real story here is the type of debt, the type of debt that's been responsible for backfilling the gap that opened up due to the nearly 10 million foreclosures that have taken place in recent years. 
Let's start with where mortgage debt tailed off, and that is student loans, by far the fastest growing category of household debt in recent years. As the economy slowed, many students and displaced workers took, took on debt to finance the higher educations they were hoping would allow them to weather the recession storm. The problem is too few high paying jobs were created while a, number, while a record number of Americans hit the books in recent years, even as the cost to attend college went through the roof. Now I'll share with you something about the latest labor report that we saw come out last Friday, which was very disappointing. Some 47% of the jobs that were created were in the eat, drink, and get sick categories. That is bars, restaurants, and healthcare. That's two and a half times their proportion of the labor force. We continue to create jobs that don't pay nearly enough. The end result, at the, at the risk of inflicting death by numbers, by the end of last year, student debt, the left-hand graph, had risen to $1.2 trillion. Meanwhile, nearly half of U.S. households are burdened with student loans, and the average balance has surpassed $20,000. The delinquency rate on this mountain of debt is about 11%. Now, the subject of delinquencies brings us to car loans. Remember what I just said about the conundrum of economic growth against a backdrop of stagnant wages? The picture becomes much clearer when you consider car loans outstanding have now surpassed a trillion dollars as well. Outstanding balances have risen by a fifth of just the past two years alone. The good news is only 3.5% are delinquent. Peek under the hood, though, and you see where growth has truly been phenomenal, to quote a recent Morgan Stanley report. Used cars were the second best performing area of consumer spending in 2014, clocking nearly 30% annualized growth rate, fastest since the 1990s. For many years, car and home sales trended in lockstep, as you can hopefully see. Then mortgage lending standards collapsed and home sales grew at a faster pace than that of car sales. You'll see the red line spiked above the blue line around the mid-2000s. Both car and home sales collapsed during the Great Recession, but only car sales have yet to rebound and are trending much higher than that of homes. So how did households with very little in the way of fatter wallets manage to finance these big ticket items? It's funny you ask. That brings us to my favorite big word. It explains why anyone who can fog a mirror today can get a car loan. Some of you will recall that we used to say the same thing about car sales. And now I'm going to identify myself as being an Austrian. So many economic students will understand what that means. Back in the, in the late 17th century, Austrian economists identified a phenomena that they termed malinvestment. Ludwig von Mises expanded on the idea, writing this in 1940. Malinvestments are badly allocated business investments made due to the artificially low cost of credit. Central banks are often blamed for causing malinvestment. Now investment occurs when artificially low interest rates mislead relative price signals, which eventually necessitates a corrective contraction. A boom followed by a bust. What are a few markets that have been injected by now investment? What, what, what are a few that personify the perception, again, the perception of prosperity? Well, I just mentioned subprime asset-backed securitization. Since 2010, issuance of subprime ABS has tripled in volume, topping $20 billion last year, and bringing the total outstanding <coughs> back to its 2006 peak. Some 73% of these are for used car loans. But again, car loans in the aggregate are just a trillion dollars. The real go-go growth has been in the bond market. At over $200 trillion, the size of the global debt market dwarfs that of the stock market. Moreover, the growth has exploded since 2007, contrary to the widespread perception that we've just lived through an era of extraordinary deleveraging. The high yield bond market alone has doubled in size in the past three years. Moreover, their share of the US corporate bond market again has doubled over the last 14 years. The question is whether the risk of holding bonds is being sufficiently rewarded. Not by the looks of this screen. The term premium on 10 year bonds, a risk reward gauge, is near cycle lows. Granted, we're not talking about triple C bonds here half of which will default over the next five years. But I would direct you back to the sheer size of the bond market and its growth as every issue has been heavily oversubscribed. It's safe to say many investors are unaware of how very overvalued their bond holdings are. Still, most believe that bonds help diversify away the risk of their stock holdings. 
Speaking of stocks, I'll share a funny story with you. I was driving the kids to school one day and had Bloomberg Radio on listening to Tom Keene. My oldest, who always prefers hits one on Sirius to my pre-market boring talk radio, surprised me in showing that he was actually paying attention. He turned to me and asked the following question. Mom, which is longer? The S&P 500 or the Indianapolis 500? <laughs> but after I stopped laughing, I answered as any markets person would. I said, that, of course, would be the S&P 500. Equities are by design a perpetuity. So, <laughs> which I, then we were at school and I was like, get out of the car, I can't explain that. <laughs> and then he got me back and came home that night and said, mom, what's infinity? So anyways, so should investors be worried about the stock market? Well, the answer is actually yes and no. If we're in the latter innings of a late 1990s rally, well then no, no need to stress about stock market valuation. Now, if you don't get any comfort from knowing that stocks are more overvalued as gauged by the size of the stock market vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. economy, well then yes, be worried. Be very worried. And keep this in mind the next time someone reassures you that the price-to-earnings ratio in the stock market is nowhere near where it was in 1999. Some estimates suggest that up to a third of profit growth since the onset of the current, current easing campaign is attributable to the decline in interest expenses. That's plausible enough if you do the math. But there's a much less obvious and yet more powerful support powering the stock market and degrading the quality of the E for earnings in the PE ratio. Since 2009, companies in the S&P 500 have bought back over $2 trillion of their own shares. Now to put this dollar figure into, into perspective, over the same time frame, Exchange traded funds, foreign buyers, insurers, mutual funds, broker dealers, private and public pensions, hedge funds, and households combined haven't even made $500 billion in aggregate stock purchases. Narrow it down to what we call mom and pop, small or retail investors, whatever you want to call them. This crew has all but abandoned the stock market in recent years as gauged by a recent Citigroup analysis. Over the past 10 years, buybacks, the blue bars, have outpaced mutual fund and exchange traded fund purchases by a factor of 40 to 1. Of course, the more shares you buy back, the fewer shares you have to use in your calculation when computing earnings per share. Do share buybacks that pump up executive bonuses do anything productive for the economy? I'm thinking no. All right, cash in again, I'll bring, back, I'll bring him back and quote him. He recently observed that companies have raised financial engineering to a Botox state. I couldn't agree anymore. But if you want to know about the real it girl in today's financial markets, look no further than commercial real estate. Now there's no doubt that both residential and commercial real estate got shellacked during the crisis. By 2009, when both markets troughed, commercial prices had declined by 40% peak to trough, while well, housing prices had fallen by 35%. The recoveries of these two markets, though, faintly resembles day and night. Housing, a market that has yet to be allowed to truly clear and has been plagued by ill-conceived regulations, has only recovered 59% of its peak to trough losses. Commercial real estate, on the other hand, has roared back to life. The latest figures <coughs> tell us that commercial real estate prices have recovered 129% of their losses. But, you know, I really do need to change the title of this slide, don't you think? <laughs> but the real action has been in multifamily. Multifamily prices have recovered an eye-popping 180% of their losses. It kind of helps that financing never took a big hit, but it helps even more that financing for residential buyers never recovered. The starkest picture I can show you of just how distorted things have become is what you're looking at on this screen. It's hard to believe how far trend off-trend multifamily construction is compared to historical norms. And I get the whole cultural thing where you're all marrying later and you're moving into the suburbs later. I get that. But it, in any event, as you can hopefully see, in a normal world, four single-family homes are constructed for every one apartment built in this country. Now, granted, there was a period during the housing boom years that there were too many single-family homes being built, which we all knew. But that spike was relatively short-lived versus where we find ourselves today. The most recent housing starts report revealed that the ratio had slipped to one to 1.4, 1 
which is lower than the depths of the most recent recession. Have we built too many apartments, or have we built too few single-family homes? Now, I suspect that the answer to that, most hope, is neither nor. History, however, suggests otherwise. By definition, so many new renters translate into too few first-time home buyers. The latest data showed 32% of sales went to first-time home buyers. It's hard to imagine that over half of sales went to freshly minted home buyers just a few years ago. That said, their anemic showing was better than the 26% record low that ended 2013. It can't hurt that home price gains have slowed care of less competition from fat and happy investors. Now, I wish that I could say that private equity had truly exited stage left due to the dearth of foreclosed properties. But the fact is, they still have other people's money to spend with abandon. So they've begun to buy up non-distressed properties. A Dallas Morning News story recently even made mention of the difficulty home buyers were having competing with investors. Now, though the share of their market is nowhere near its March 2011 peak, at 22%, all cash buyers remain a formidable form of competition for first-timers. That's the funny thing about playing with someone else's money. It makes it really easy to win a bidding war. The loss of so many first-time homebuyers has caused a crash in the homeownership rate, which we've just learned has fallen to the lowest level since 1967, before any of you were born. <laughs> since 2004, when the homeownership rate peaked, some 8.6 million renters have been created, while the ranks of homeowners have actually contracted by 1.2 million. I'm asked all the time, whether the time has finally come for housing to really take off again. They were just talking about it on Squawk Box when I was leaving the house. My answer is that I can't really see a pathway back to pre-crisis level. The budgetary burden on young would-be homeowners is just too heavy. What's more worrisome yet is that the situation could get worse for the generation behind the millennials. It's a gross understatement to say that the cost to send your kids to college has skyrocketed in recent years. Since 2000, the cost of tuition and, um, and fees plus room and board have doubled to over $42,000. It's a big number. Of course, it doesn't cost near as much to attend a public university, but the growth has been just as magnificent. By the way, you may note that the growth trajectory went parabolic right around the time that cash out refinancing was all the rage. Next time you choke at that tuition bill to say nothing of student housing costs, remember to thank the Fed for producing yet another consequence of leaving rates too low for too long. It's no wonder that 47% of American families don't have the ability to save even one thin dime out of their current income. Even if they could save, they wouldn't be permitted to, to be prudent in their investment allocation. Fed policy has practically criminalized savings by keeping interest rates at the zero bound. A Swiss Re report that came out earlier this year quantified the fore foregone savings since 2009 to be about a half billion dollars that we have not earned in interest. Can you imagine how badly baby boomers yearn for the good old days when they could walk into the local branch of their bank and take out a jumbo CD for 5% for five years? Instead, they've been forced to swing for the fences, which is saying something when you consider how little so many have saved. A recent report found that the typical working household with a 401k approaching retirement had only $111,000 set aside. I suppose that's not too alarming when you consider the fact that 60 is the new 40, at least that's what I'm banking on. Many of those folks are gonna continue working for years. But what about the ranks of Americans who really need to retire after a lifetime of work? Over the next 25 years, the population aged 65 and older will swell by 38 million people, nearly double the growth of those aged 20 to 64. Among those folks, about 25 million boomers will endeavor to sell their homes over just the next 15 years. That is, if move-up buyers mysteriously appear in mass. The chances of that happening is pretty low given that we've lost an entire generation of first-timers. Of course, many of these boomers need to sell their home to monetize the equity that they have in their home so that they can, in turn, retire. They're the lucky ones if they have that home equity built up. 
Maybe you should call what you're looking at on this screen the housing hangover. Four in 10 seniors, seniors over the age of 65 still have a mortgage. The median mortgage debt for this cohort is just over $80,000. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Young and old alike, one has to wonder what the future holds. When will many households own up to their addiction to debt? Well, I suppose the answer comes down to when it actually pays to save. And yet here we sit with interest rates firmly planted at the zero bound, though the hope is policymakers are finally ready to bite the bullet in high rates. Stay tuned. Maybe, just maybe, the time has come. And maybe, just maybe, normalized interest rates, as we call them, wouldn't be such a bad thing, especially if it pulled the plug on malinvestment. King Edward VIII's abdication of the throne was no doubt shocking at the time. At the same time, though, the act of love has gone down in history as one of the most romantic of all time. Today's abdication has not one redeeming factor. I think we all know that it's high time Congress did right by this country. I hope you too can now appreciate that it's well past the time for the Federal Reserve to stop enabling congressional misfeasance, and in doing so, restore the financial markets to their proper function as price discovery mechanisms. After all, uninhibited price discovery is the bedrock of a free market economy. Living within our means, saving our hard-earned dollars, sacrificing today to ensure for a better tomorrow, these are the disciplines that helped foster a superpower economy. But the fact remains, lower for longer has ravaged those who dare save, while richly rewarding those engaged in reckless investment behavior. I'm here to tell you that the current era has outlasted its welcome. Policymakers keeping interest rates at the zero bound may have intended to revive animal spirits by making debt so cheap for so long that it's impossible to not play along. But nearly 30 years later, in the wake of one speculative boom and subsequent collapse after another, I'm afraid to say we haven't learned nearly enough as a country. It is not the creation of debt that makes a lasting impact on economic prosperity. Rather, it's investment in the future that promises to retain its value for generations to come. And with that happy note, I will take any questions you're happy to have. background, I kind of touched on your career history, but oh, we're sure. all starting our careers. Can you give us um, kind of background of where your career journey took sure. you to where you're at now? It is not a normal route, and it had to do something with two big towers falling down. Um, and I don't say that tongue-in-cheek at all. Um, I thought that I was going to stay on Wall Street forever. But, uh, but after 9-11, all of our perspectives changed a little bit. So when I came back from Texas, where I spent Christmas that year, I, I met my husband to be shortly thereafter. And um, long distance dating between LaGuardia and DFW is, I don't recommend it. Uh, it wasn't a lot of fun. So about six months later, he asked me to move to Dallas. And I had just finished getting my second master's in journalism because I figured when I retired many years later that I would at least have a ticket into the door of any old newspaper in America so that I could go and write and be free of compliance and all of its shackles. In any event, uh, when he said move to Dallas, Credit Suisse has a huge office there. You'll, yeah, this is great. I can, I can be a stay-at-home dad. I went, what? Um, and then I said equities and Dallas. So if, if any of you have read Liar's Poker, raise your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For the rest of you, it's recommended, required, whatever you want to call it, go out and buy Liar's Poker. It was a huge influence on my life. Um, and I no longer believe equities in Dallas is necessarily Siberian purgatory. But it's what I thought when I lived in New York, that I wasn't going to work off Wall Street in Dallas. So anyways, I did something unusual. Most of my, most of my um, book was done directly with the trading floor. So instead of giving my business directly to an individual, I gave it to the floor and then they gave me lots of money and I signed a non-compete and agreed to leave the industry for a while. At which point I picked the phone, I called Robert Deckard, I said I understand you run this company named Belo. I'm not sure I've, I've ever seen a Dallas Morning News. I understand the president reads the sports section every day, so it's got to be worth something. So I'll work for free. That was, those are my words. I don't write, just don't take notes on I'll work for free. Don't write that down. Don't, 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 don't be the oldest intern to ever walk into the Dallas Morning News, which I was. 
Uh, six months later, I had my own column on uh, the markets. I was their first daily columnist, and um, I wrote terrible things about Alan Greenspan and terrible things about the housing market and subprime mortgages. Uh, Warren Buffett called me one day. I got to go out to Omaha. I had readers all over. It was a lot of fun, a lot of fun, a lot of fun, until one day when my phone rang, and it was Bunny Hartman for Richard Fisher. So uh, I had lunch with Mr. Fisher at the Petroleum Club, and within about a year or so, uh, I received a phone call from the Fed, and they asked me to, uh, to come work for them. And um, any of you who want to be on my newsletter, you just give me your email, and you can read Ladies Don't Dance on Graves, which I wrote about a month ago or so. And when people ask me, why would you leave the freedom of the Dallas Morning News to go work with one of the biggest bureaucracies on the planet, my stock answer always was, Ladies Don't Dance on Graves. It's one thing to predict a housing crisis and be right. It's another thing to watch readers who used to send hate mail send apologies via email, saying, I'm so sorry that I criticized you like I did. I shouldn't have forced my husband to take out that home equity loan and get rid of the yellow linoleum, because now you know, me and my two kids and, and my husband were all being foreclosed on the losing arm. So that wasn't any fun. So I said, maybe I can make a difference um, if I go serve my country and go work for Richard Fisher, which is what I did. So I covered every aspect of the financial markets for him, from the high yield bond market, to the housing market, to commercial real estate, to private <coughs> equity, to hedge funds, to stocks, to bonds, you name it. So I did that for him for the better part of a decade, uh, producing a, a, a briefing document before every FOMC meeting. I got to go to New York before every FOMC meeting. Therese came with me, boy, did we have fun uh, when she was working with me. Uh, but you sit down, you pick people's brains, you try and, and get a feel for where the markets are, and that's kind of what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And I, I followed Fisher right out the door, because it was the man I was working for, not the institution. I wouldn't know what to do with a PhD in economics. But anyway, so it's been a lot of fun since then, and you can tune in to CNBC and see me from time to time. I've just started writing a newsletter, and it's a lot of fun to come out of the gate and be able to breathe the air again and tell the truth, because Fisher fought the good fight. I helped Fisher fight the good fight, but we didn't win. And I have serious doubts about where this economy and where the financial markets are headed, because uh, as Jim Grant of Grant's newsletter said yesterday, uh, the Fed theoretically has a double mandate and that would be to maximize employment and to ensure price stability. But uh, I'm going to steal from his line, and I'm going to write it in my next weekly, uh, that their true double mandate has become A, arsonist, and B, fireman. And that's kind of what I see Fed policy is doing. They set the fire, and then they put it out. And then they go, and they hit the reset button, and they do it again. So in my little humble opinion. Now, you all, I can tell you're all intelligent. I mean, you've got ties on, you're awake, you're drinking your coffee, so somebody's going to have a question. <laughs> Whoa, okay. um, yes, sir. So it's interesting. A lot of what you said was talking about how the Fed's been unduly influenced by Congress and all the mandates that Congress has put forth, but it's, you know, and so again, I understand, I don't understand it. And well, everything issue. Congress has not done. As well. Right, but so I've always learned and been taught that the Fed is relatively isolated and that one of the big turning points is when they received the dual mandate, and that's when the decision making process changed and the amounts changed for the Fed. So what I don't understand is when you talk about the things Congress has done and not done, and I get in, you know, the big picture, you know, the incentives to buy homes, the they probably should involve things like that. What specifically do you mean by that? What was it that Congress did well, that seemed the Fed out of whack and the change? Here's my favorite example, and I, I might show a little stress. Um, the Scandinavians have a different approach to long-term unemployment. They'll pay to retrain somebody get them an associate's degree, maybe they used to be a roofer, train them to be a welder. They'll invest two years worth of taxpayer money in helping somebody gain a new skill, find a new profession. When interest rates are really low, it's really easy to get things like 99 weeks of unemployment insurance passed, and then repassed, and then repassed. And it's really easy to expand the disability roles. And what we've seen is a very quiet expansion of the social safety net. But I want to tell you that the average American who is not in the workforce, we've seen, I mean, we're at the lowest level of labor force participation since 1976. And it's not because these people want to be out of the workforce. I promise you, everybody would rather have a job. But we haven't retrained them when we could have. Congress could have spent the money more wisely 
we could have new bridges and tunnels. The Corps of Engineers has identified $4 trillion worth of repairs needed to our nation's infrastructure. And there it sits. So there were a lot of smarter things that Congress could have done rather than just take the easy path. And that's what I'm saying. But the easy path has been available to them because they can go on and on about reducing the deficit. The deficit wouldn't be reduced at all. And the debts continue to grow if it was not like that. And that's my point. There was another question. I'll play Tom King. What's your call on the rise of interest rates? When's it going to be and how much? So the best I've heard, because I had this, actually just driving over here, took three words out of what I'm about to publish this morning. Because I said it was basically a fait accompli, that they're not raising rates. That the labor, labor report was so weak, and specifically the back revisions to the labor report. That was really what was, I mean, we've had negative revisions going out for since November. So it, it suggests that the economy is turning. Um, however, John Williams was born and raised under Janet Yellen, San Francisco Fed. And he made a speech after the labor report came out. And it said that given the slow growth of the population and given the slow growth of the labor market, we could get away with just creating 100,000 jobs a month. I don't know if anybody heard that speech. But if it's the case that policymakers are willing to accept a lower growth rate in the non-farm payroll numbers, then it's highly possible they're trying to signal that they're going to go in October. Going in December is a rat's nest. They might do it. But market liquidity is terrible at the end of the year, on December the 18th, when they would be making that decision. So I wrote an op-ed for the Financial Times recently. I hope you all would look at it. And it basically said, call a press conference in October and do it now. So they don't shock the market on October the 28th and say, we're having a press conference, and the market crashes. It's not good to do it that day. Policymakers, I think, probably realize that the global economy is veering towards recession and that it might take us down with it and that our own economy is slowing. The renewed decline in oil prices hasn't helped. Um, but I think for reasons that we can talk about after that are mechanistic, that have to do with the functionality of money market funds, I think they know that, it, that they need to raise rates, even if it's just a one and done, just to help out with the functionality of, of the overnight rate market which I'll get way deep in the week. If you give me your card after, I'll add you to you can read illiquid plumbing when you can't sleep. And it talks about the plumbing of the financial system. I think they want to go in October. And if they don't, they might not go forever. So, yes? Um, so I worked for Dallas County, and this past year we had another record uh, property tax year. And while it's great for our revenue, we are looking at a concern for the upcoming years um, with the continued growth and what that means for the local market. Do you have any insight onto you know, what you're seeing here in Dallas? Because last time in the recession, we were a little insulated because the, you know, our property value wasn't yeah, as are, high as it is now. We are one of the go-go markets. Right, and that's right concerning for us. High. Yeah. Um, so either something rights the ship. I mean, we've got four or five million dollar spec homes going up everywhere. This makes 2006 look like nothing. Um, there will be aging people, aging Dallas sites that have to leave. They have to get out of their homes. You'll see property tax foreclosures. We saw them during the last cycle, not a lot of them, but you will see property tax foreclosures if this continues. And or you will see the attractiveness of the city itself um, lessen because people no longer perceive it as being a place where you can live affordably. I'm, I'm sitting on, I'm, I'm writing about inflation next week and the inflation that the Fed ignores, and that's the inflation of rental pricing, uh, apartments, single families. Um, and once you price renters and home buyers out of a market, which Dallas is trying really hard to do, <laughs> uh, then people go look for alternatives. So I get that we're centrally located. My husband works in the packaging industry. I see all the companies that are relocating to this area of the country, and I get it. And it's intuitive, and we still have no state income tax. 
But no state income tax does not necessarily mean that you can't tax people out of the market. And that's a concern that I have. De definitely. Good question. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> early thousands, you had the tech bubble, which caused the market crash, and then it's like kind of more than most recently. Um, some financial experts would say we're going to do about the recession. What do you see as the biggest pressure points this time around? Well, so how can I we avoid? Well, I don't know that we can avoid the decline in commodity prices because it's a global phenomenon. We can't avoid Brazil and Russia and Canada being in recession. These are things we cannot avoid. Um, so my, my biggest concern is what I brought up earlier, which is the type of jobs that are being created right now. Um, energy jobs that were created because of the shale revolution paid a lot of money. We're talking about 75,000 up. And leisure and hospitality jobs, yeah, it's about a $30,000 paycheck. It's a big difference. And my greatest concern, we've seen a decline in weekly retail sales that's unusual given that car sales are explosive. But car sales are explosive for a reason. It's because the, the credit is there to buy the car, or in this case, the F-150, which record sales. Um, but buying a car on credit and creating the illusion of strong retail sales and having a shrinking paycheck, they don't go hand in hand. They go in opposite directions. And again, we're a consumption-driven economy. If the whole rest of the world, and that's an exaggeration, but if China's slowing, if, if the supply chain to China is slowing, and we've seen these numbers coming out of Indonesia, Vietnam, we, we've seen some, some, some contracting manufacturing statistics these last few days, if that continues, I don't know how long we can exist on an island of prosperity if we don't have wage growth. So we are way overdue for a recession. I guess it's okay. I'm going to have to have one woman in this room ask a question. So we all <laughs> don't feel any pressure, but I've only had questions from the guys this morning, so and not not her, not her. I'll advocate my question. Oh, that's so sweet. When you ask that. <laughs> I guess it's kind of springboarding off of that. If you're trying to, like, I guess, take a contrarian view and not, you know, be a sheep to the slaughter. I mean, what kind of asset classes are you looking at in terms of long-term growth? Because you got to. I mean, you can't just pull out your market and hide in the corner. And so. Well, you can own a lot of municipal bonds <laughs> that are that are backed by true revenue streams. So if you're trying to, um, I mean, withstand the wave. So don't, don't listen to that. <laughs> so if you're just trying to withstand the wave, because markets ride waves. Well, I get so. that, but markets. Uh, well, you're young. You can write it out. But cybersecurity, healthcare. I mean, there are certain undeniables in this world. Um, I mean, I wouldn't really say iPhone. I mean, somebody characterized Apple and, a, and an iPhone as being a luxury item. And I thought that, that was a really brilliant way of putting it. It's not the utility of a phone. It's a thing. It's a thing that you can attach cachet to. Um, but there are certain. There are certain areas of the economy that will be bulletproof, and I think cybersecurity, and because of, well, because of, I get a new Citigroup card in the mail every six months, whether I want it or not, because it's been compromised. But I think cybersecurity and healthcare with an aging population are two areas of the economy that are kind of no-brainers. Um, but but I, I worry about all those unicorns out there in Silicon Valley, and whether or not the Twitters of the world are worth. You know, what they're trading at, and social media, and the whole thing. I think there's, I think there's probably consolidation to come in that industry uh, going forward, and that a lot of the wealth that's been created on, on the West Coast is going to vaporize. Um, but look for look for areas that won't be affected by recession. Basically. So. Okay, ladies. Anybody? All right. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> There seems to be a, a battle between policy and culture. So we're so consumer driven. I mean, even if the interest rates were outstanding, some people would still spend their last time. Whereas other cultures, it's a saving culture. So we used to be a saving culture. Yeah. How does that shift happen? Um, it has to be incentivized. And in order to incentivize, you have to pay. <coughs> to pay, you have to normalize interest rates. And you have to, by the same token, not have politicians come out and say, every American needs to own a home. 
Now, they're not saying that today, but they said it years ago, and it got a lot of households into trouble because they bought more than they could afford. So having our nation's leader, leaders, excuse me, insist that we begin again to go back to our roots of being a country that lives within its means and investing in our future, as opposed to taking on debt to try and fabricate a future. These are things that need, I mean, this, that's where, that's what you do it the first Thursday in November. First Thursday? First Tuesday. First Tuesday? Yeah. I vote. I mean, I just, you know, but I, I need to, I need to, you know, I, I tell my, my phone to tell me when to go. But, um, and that's good. Thank y'all for, for all of this generation making our life um, But that's where voting comes into play, and that's where electing leaders who, uh, I'm not making a political statement of any kind, but the only thing that I've, I, I've read two good things so far, and I'm not going to name their names, but one politician said that we need to, get rid of the notion that a four-year degree is de rigueur in this country. Because if I get a four-year degree in God knows what, and I only can become a barista, I've wasted my time and my money, or, my, or I've taken on debt together, or I've wasted my parents' money. But one politician who's out there is saying, we can become a more vocationally driven, IT globally driven country. And it, it doesn't take more than two years to build up to some kind of a technological skill and or. I mean, the average electrician in this country is 53 years old. And that's why they make so much money. Uh, because there's not a generation behind it. Because there was this stigma of going mm -hmm. into some of these vocations. But they, they have utility. And they have need. And they're well-paying jobs by the same token. But you need politicians getting out there and saying that. The other intelligent thing I heard is that you need to take away the marriage penalty when it comes to filing your taxes. So you don't need to incentivize the husband or the wife. None of your you don't need to incentivize the husband or the wife to make less money because you're going to get penalized if you make more. But those are the only two intelligent things I've heard so far. So after I, and, and that's about it. But, uh, but, but when you hear these things and you, you're like, that makes sense, that makes sense. Because if you can check off that box, it's going to help the country grow better, vote for them. So. Which is a good point, and we talk about this a lot in our committee, but if anybody here needs to register to vote, we all have to do it once for the first time. Um, it's something to be embarrassed about. And the people who are deputized who can get you to register very simply. So let us know if you need help with that. And it's no, there you go. It's, if you haven't voted before, there's no, it's, it's good to do. All right then. So we have, can you help, I guess, help me understand how we have all these smart individuals at that FOMC, the PhDs, and I have to assume that again, yeah, these are intelligent people. But yet, they, you know, based on your presentation, they're not making the right decision. So, can you tell me what is it that's keeping them from making this decision of raising interest rates? And I mean, why is it that they're not doing this? If again, we're, we have to make the assumption that these are intelligent people. Oh, well, they're brilliant. They're more intelligent than me. Um, but I was kind of a tradesman inside the organization, and I let my eyes and ears tell me what was happening. And I allowed the powers of observation to rule my thinking. I combined that with economics and my economics background and my finance background. But again, I didn't ignore what was staring me in the face. And I think the biggest challenge to the current generation of FOMC members is that too many of them have been schooled to make policy using models. And if it doesn't fit in the model, then it's not incorporated. And that's what got us into the financial crisis. And that's what got us into the dot-com boom and bust. Uh, but you have to, I think, come up with a new mousetrap when it comes to making policy that is not purely model-driven. And you need to have more people like Richard Fisher as presidents of FOMCs uh, in order to to make policy that incorporates the real world and the academic, theoretical, model-driven world. It needs to be both. Especially because they've spent the better part of 30 years distorting the economic data by monkeying with interest rates, which they've done. So that's the other problem they have is they can't even look back at the, own, at the old economic data 
because prior to 1987, when Alan Greenspan came in and created the Greenspan put and put a floor under losses for investors, when he changed the rules of the game, he also began to distort the data that his very economists relied on to make decisions. So, Edward Bramlick is my, may he rest in peace, is my favorite central banker of all time. And he wrote a book about the subprime, uh, the subprime market. He walked into Greenspan's office and, and said, listen, we need to try and get out in front of this. This is going to end really badly. And Greenspan answered him, well, we only regulate 25% of the lenders. So there's nothing that we can do, and we need to let the market take care of this. Well, it did, and then some. But again, they had the power, and, and the Fed caught the entire falling knife. It didn't matter that they only regulated 25% of mortgage lending in the country. They had to clean up the entire 100% of the mess. So they need to understand that when they look at private equity and some of the roles that it's begun to play in our bond market. Because even though they're not technically regulated entities, they're still part of the financial system. And they still need to take into account they don't. So they've got to change their way of thinking. So I know a lot of this presentation is based on domestic concerns, housing, and labor. And the Fed has, I think, been clear in a lot of their statements about the uncertainty in international markets. So that kind of goes to your point about the Fed being between a rock and a hard place here, balancing all these stakeholders. They're getting a lot of pressure to raise rates here, and a lot of pressure in international markets to say, hey, put on the brakes a little bit, we need some time. How do they balance that role? Are they putting too much weight on those? International markets should they be more focused on the American economy? What do you what do you see there? They should have been more focused on ignoring the emerging markets two years ago. <laughs> now they're really hard to ignore. So there was an opportunity. There was a time to raise interest rates and not necessarily set off some <coughs> global cataclysm. Um, but if they do it today, the IMF warned last week, we've got real problems on our hands because the size of the global non-financial corporate debt market has quadrupled over the past few years and it's now $18 trillion. So once you start throwing about trillions here and trillions there, then you know you've got problems on your hands. And we don't know how a lot of this, by the way, dollar-denominated debt is going to behave with the raise interest rates. And that's what's put the Fed in between a rock and a hard place. But again, don't just pay attention to what's going on outside the country in terms of pressuring the Fed into action or inaction, for that matter. The strong dollar has, has taken a toll on our own exporters, which we saw in yesterday's trade data. And again, we, manufacturing doesn't drive our economy, but changes at the margin can turn it. And again, I would take you back to oil, shale, high paying jobs. Um, we've seen upwards of 81,000 jobs lost in the past year, the jobs that used to support the mining industry, which includes energy. So there's, there's tentacles, there's fallout from the decline in energy prices. It's not just related to, good God, what's going to happen to Houston. So it's, it's, it's not an easy, good question, no easy answer. All right, well, y'all have been the most attentive <laughs> audience. Thank you so much for all Thanks. of your attention. Thanks.